Welcome to MRTV's People in XR. This is the podcast that introduces you to the most exciting players in the industry. And here is your host, Sebastian Ong. In this episode of the People in XR podcast, it is my utmost pleasure to say hello to Dominic Escoffier, who is the head of VR Europe at NVIDIA. Hi, Dominic. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going, guys? Very, very well. It's really my pleasure to speak with you because it cannot go more in depth about the VR business than talking with you. Why don't you tell our viewers and listeners where you are right now and actually what you're doing in general at NVIDIA? So in general, I'm a huge virtual reality enthusiast and also, the, as you said, the head of virtual reality for the EMEA region at NVIDIA, which means Europe, Middle East, Africa and India. And today I'm um, at in Munich, my hometown, and I'm at the offices of Hologate, which for those of you who don't know, is a virtual reality company from Germany um, that is building four player VR systems. And um, today I'm here because I had, a, I had an appointment uh, with them before and they were so nice to allow me to take this as kind of a backdrop for, for this podcast. And Perfect. yeah, I mean, my role at NVIDIA is really taking care of all things virtual reality. So um, some people in the office call me the VR guy because I literally do everything with virtual reality from plugging in base stations at events to high level marketing campaigns with HTC and Oculus to developer relations. I do a lot of things where um, we're taking care of the whole ecosystem more or less. So for, for NVIDIA and Many of you probably know what NVIDIA does. We are selling the GPUs to drive high-end virtual reality experiences. Wow. And those, those virtual reality experiences usually really need a, a, powerful, a powerful PC. Yes. And my role is to make sure that virtual reality grows as an, as an ecosystem. So making sure that young developers, small developers get the support they need, um, connecting them with people from the industry, um, lots of things like um, promoting virtual reality, um, so making sure that companies are aware that virtual reality can actually help them um, drive more business and save resources and time. So it's both, a, it's both a role where I take care of the consumer market um, as well as the, the enterprise market where obviously um, there's lots of benefits of using virtual reality. Wow. This is like a very, very broad position. So it seems like it uh, yeah. your, your, your job is like very... Yeah, uh, lots of facets to it. You have lots of different things to do. So, um, what, what what would you say is your your main your main job? What is your day to day life at Nvidia look like? What is what what is what does take most of your time right now? Ah, oh, that's a very good question. It's a very broad it's a very broad topic. Um, many a lot of my time and many mails that I'm sending are internal mails where we align with other business units on how we can use virtual reality in their, in their business area. So for example, um, I sit very close to the, to the social media team um, who are always looking for cool things to post on our social media channels. Um, I'm, I'm working a lot internally with the enterprise team to make sure that our big enterprise customers like Volkswagen, Airbus and so on and so forth, they get the support they need when it comes to any type of virtual reality stuff. Um, a lot of my time is actually um, goes into um, traveling to events, both to get a good overview of the ecosystem in, in Europe and, and, and the other regions that I'm taking care of, but also promoting um, Nvidia virtual reality tech. So one of the things that um, one of the things that we're producing for the um, for the for the ecosystem is called the VRWorks SDK. It's essentially a suite of tools. Um, that allow you to squeeze out more performance from your virtual reality experience. So it's good for it's good for developers, and to make sure that those developers know about everything that's happening, um, and know about this technology, it's it's important that they're actually um, that they actually get to know that. So I'm on the side also promoting our NVIDIA solutions to the development crowd out there and just making sure that, that NVIDIA is a brand that you automatically think of when you're, when you're thinking about virtual reality. Great. Perfect. One moment. I have to do something here on my computer, but that, until now it's perfect already. <laughs> yeah, good that this is not live. So, great. There were just people running through the thing, but it's, it should be okay. Okay.
Okay, now it's better. Okay, cool. That sounds really interesting. So actually, um, this job is probably not a technical job. It's more like um, a business business job, is it? Uh, it's a good question. It's 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 all of those things. So my my background is in is in PR and marketing and business development. I've uh, also started a virtual reality startup called Realities.io, where I was uh, CEO. So essentially taking taking care of all the business roles. And, and, and so on and so forth, but I'm also a very technical person. So um, my journey started with the DK1, and for those of you out there who've tried setting up a DK1, it was at, like you really need, needed to know your technical stuff. It wasn't something that you just plugged in and it worked. Um, it was, especially the early development kits, they were a little bit rough around the edges, I would say. Um, and so you really need to have a technical understanding. And I also I also studied I also studied um, electrical engineering. Oh, so me too. my back is, is oh hey there you go. Yeah. Uh, and now we're both in virtual reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually funny because it's actually funny because when I when I studied electrical engineering, I wanted to be on the forefront of a technology. I'm, I'm very much a tech-driven person. I love technology. I think technology is really the way forward. And for me, working like studying electrical engineering, I always wanted to to be on the on the cutting edge of technology. Right. And then suddenly, uh, virtual reality came around, and I'm probably going to tell you a little bit more about my my personal background exactly. later. Um, suddenly, virtual reality came around, and this this background I had in, in, in electrical engineering and also in PR and marketing. Now these skills come together, and and I can use them in this in this young industry, and that's that's really really nice. It's amazing. Wow, so interesting that we both actually we have a very similar background. I think I also studied electrical engineering, and well, I also have a business background as well with an MBA. So, but now I'm on YouTube, and you are the head of VR. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a amazing. roller. It's a roller coaster ride working in virtual. <laughs> yeah, I tell you. Exactly. <laughs> One day, one day you think, wow, this technology is going to change the world. Next day, next day you're like, oh my God, where is this going? What, what am I doing with my life? Yeah, exactly, um, in, exactly. In the end, I'm, I'm still a very much a very firm believer, despite all the naysayers out there about, yeah. hey, it's virtual reality. Is the virtual reality hype gone? Is, is, is we are dead? dead? <laughs> no, exactly. Those crazy things. No, no, and same I'm, here. Just, just look at the numbers. Look at the look at the amount of people on Steam. I very much still believe. Um, that virtual reality will change the way we, we, we play, the way we work, and the way we learn. So education is a big topic that I, I might tap into um, later on a little bit as well. Oh, wow. I'm so looking forward to get into depth with you about this. It's going to be amazing. So for all the people who are listening to this or watching this, probably you already guessed from our accents that we're both not really American or English, but instead we're both from good old Germany. So two Germans trying to let you know a bit more about VR. I think it's going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, so um, we talked a bit about NVIDIA and, um, and I'm, I'm wondering how important is the topic VR for NVIDIA? It's a very, it's a very important topic. Um, so for the, when I joined, when I joined um, Nvidia two and a half years ago, it was very much um, a, a growth pillar for Nvidia. So we were really, we, we are really um, of the mindset that virtual reality will become a pervasive technology. And pervasive in that sense means that it will impact lots, it will impact many parts of society. And I just I just tapped into that a little bit. Obviously, Nvidia is a, is a visual computing company, so we really have our background in rendering photorealistic worlds, and that is for games. So one pillar that we we strongly believe will change um, through and through uh, virtual reality is entertainment, personal entertainment. Um, whether it's being immersed immediately in your favorite game, um, just by putting on a VR headset or making sure that those virtual reality experiences run at better performance. Um, all of this, all of this is, is very much our background. This is where our expertise lies and where we can bring a lot to the table for virtual reality. Um, so this is the entertainment part, but then we also strongly believe that it will, it will change the way we work. 
So in a, in, a, in a work environment, and you're seeing this in many, many companies out there, whether it's the German railway system, uh, people like Airbus, Volkswagen, Daimler, um, those, those really big companies, they are actually right now already deploying virtual reality solutions because it makes them uh, spend less resources and less money on some of these, on some of these topics. And my, my favorite, my, so this is, how, this is how it will impact the workspace. And one of my favorite examples is um, from the German railway system. It's, uh, it's German, German railway is kind of known around the world for being super punctual, um, super on time. Everything works flawlessly. For those people who are from Germany, they might not, they might not agree. I that just much. meant to say, like, yeah, well. <laughs> but but really, actually, actually speaking to people from, from other countries, our, our railway system is, is pretty good. Okay. Really good. Okay. And good to know. many people know is, that making that system work is um, is a system that employs 300,000 um, people worldwide. So the wow. German railway system is really it's it's a huge company. It's a huge corporate. And what they usually did um, is when they've got new systems to train on, right? So for example, there's a new train coming, right? The, the a, a new high speed train is coming onto the German railway system, and then. Many people need to, all the, all the employees, they need to learn about how to use the, the systems in that train. So one example is um, the new high-speed train in Germany has a, a lift system for um, handicapped passengers, or so for people in a, in a wheelchair. And it's a complicated thing, right? It's a, it's a very expensive, complicated thing that you have to know the ins and outs of. You have to know which screws to unscrew, what levers to pull, how right. to lift left down this lift and so on and so forth and you have to do that while the train is in the station so it can't take long right so people need to be really good using this lift system and what the what the german what the german railway system now does is um they, they've taken these old school training centers and virtualize them so instead of instead of bringing people to a train um, that just stands there in the training center and that people can be can be trained on. They virtualize all of that, so they can bring the training centers to the to the people that need to learn about these systems. And so so they, they save they save costs, as in they don't have to bring people to the training center. They they generate more revenue because the trains are actually running from Munich to Berlin, for example, and generating revenue instead of being just parked in a training center. And on top of that, what what the German railway system has found is that um, there's there's the there's the, the, the crazy phenomenon that people who are training in virtual reality they actually perform better at the real world tasks than those who have learned it on the real systems, wow. which sounds super counterintuitive, right? Yeah. But the, the main reasoning for that is if you're training if you're training one of these complex procedures on a real train. You're, you're essentially training it on a 100,000, 200,000 euro machine, and you're very much afraid to break it All because right. you're, 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 just not, you're just not confident. Like you can, you're, you're always thinking that you can do so many things wrong. In virtual reality, it essentially becomes a game where people try to unscrew this as yeah. fast as possible. They whip around the lever, they do all these things without the fear of breaking things. And so, because it's a playful way and also a non um, um, non intrusive way of, of, of training these scenarios, they perform better than the people that have trained it on the real machinery. So that it's really incredible. a win-win-win situation. They save resources. They don't have to. Their their employees don't have to travel, and they perform better in those in those tasks. That's just one example of how an enterprise can use virtual reality in their workspace. So we, we've got the entertainment covered. We've got the work covered, and. On top of that, I, I strongly believe that it will change the way we learn. And this is this is something where I strongly believe in the, the, the classrooms of the future. And those of you who have seen uh, Ready Player One, they know how something like that might look like, where you're not on, or read the book. It's not so much in the movie, it's much more in the book, where future education really relies on bringing the best teachers to you through a virtual reality headset and learning at the pace that you want Within the surrounding that you want, and this is something. This is something that I that I, I'd love to explore a little bit more in this in this, in this uh, conversation. Oh yeah, we're going to do that because it makes so much sense to have everything play out in virtual reality. Why would you have to really physically go to that classroom, right, and spend hundreds of dollars to to make that travel cost or whatever? 
when you can just meet in virtual reality and can be anywhere yep. in this world. It makes so much sense. So for, for all of you who have not read the book but only watched the movie, please read the book. It is just so much better. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like actually, wow. <laughs> actually, I don't think I've... Okay, I, I really like the movie, to be honest. I think I think what they, they've made it quite well within like a two hours to yes. just pack that right. script. Right. Um, but the, 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 the book just tells a little bit more about the background of the Oasis. So why do people do that? Why do people spend so much time there? And I and, and in the in the movie it's just hey it's a cool place to hang out with my friends. But in right. the book you really get a, an idea of the benefits of that, that virtual reality has for many of these um, for many of these, um, these these topics. Exactly. And so yeah, to, to come back to your original question, this is what in, this is the the, the kind of um, level that Nvidia thinks about virtual reality. We believe that it will change entertainment, it will change work, it will change education, and it will change. It will probably change some parts of our everyday life that we're not even thinking about. So Nvidia is, is very much invested. In, in virtual reality. Yeah, it makes sense. So also as a business driver for NVIDIA itself, right? Because, well, if uh, the whole world runs these experiences on your GPUs, well, it seems like a solid business. <laughs> it is, it is, it is definitely. Right, is definitely. cool. Um, it, also, it, also makes my, it also makes my job at NVIDIA a little bit easier because I don't necessarily, like in the end, what NVIDIA does is selling GPUs, right? Right. And, in my role, I don't have to go out and, and sell GPUs. I can promote the idea of virtual reality. And because NVIDIA right now has a 90 to 95% market share in VR, every time I'm promoting virtual reality, I'm also promoting um, GPUs on the side. Okay, and so this, sure. this, makes, this, makes, this makes my life a little bit, my work life a little bit easier because as I said in the beginning, I'm just a huge virtual reality enthusiast. So what a, what a perfect job talking. you have, man. It's like you, you are a VR enthusiast, you love the technology, and then your job is it to promote that technology that you love. It sounds like a, like perfect. It is, it, is a, it, is a, it, is a, it is a great job, to be honest. Um, there's, there's obviously, um, with, with everything that you're, that you're doing, there's ob obviously always a, um, some, there's always some downsides. No job yeah, is course. perfect, right? So the, like I always said, the, gra the grass is always greener on the other side. Right. And the, the, obviously working in a, in a big corporate like that, where I'm recording to different people all across the globe, essentially, those are, those are sometimes a little bit of bit, bit tricky situations. But in general, working for a company that's so invested in VR, being such a VR enthusiast myself, it's, it's really great. I'm, 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 I'm really enjoying being able to talk about the topic that I, that I really love. Perfect. Yeah, the same here. Every day, it's just amazing. So um, I'm wondering, when did NVIDIA kind of um, realize it for themselves, how important VR might be for their, for their business future? And together with that, uh, one, when did they start to have like your job position as in like head of VR? When, when did that happen? Is it also like, like uh, two or three years ago when the consumer things came out, but uh, probably earlier, right? What, when it did was, it happen? It was, it, it was way before that, yeah, you're right. It, it, was, it was way before that. So to make sure that, um, even early virtual reality experiences like the DK2, um, that they work well on the GPUs that we're building. There's a lot you have to do on the, on the software side as well, on the, on the driver side. And to, to make sure that those drivers are working really well, uh, NVIDIA had many engineers work on that topic very early in the game. So that was, that was actually, back then I was still working at Rockstar Games. And that was in 2012 or 2013 was the first time that NVIDIA committed to uh, spending engineering resources on virtual reality. So essentially what they did is they had a system back then, or they still have a system called 3D Vision. And it's, it's 3D Vision is a system where you have um, essentially 3D gaming on your, on your uh, monitor, on your traditional gaming monitor. But what it does is it also has stereoscopy. So it does 3D rendering. And obviously, you can use that as a baseline to use that, those, that stereo rendering, so rendering for the left eye and rendering for the right eye, and then adapt those technologies, adapt that code base for um, proper virtual reality rendering. And 
and that was in I think in 2013. So back then I, I didn't I wasn't working for Nvidia, but it was just great for me as a VR enthusiast to see that companies see the potential of virtual reality. So those were kind of the early those were the, the early stages. Wow. And then we had a team working on we had a team working on virtual reality. Um, since 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 then, since 2012, 2013, and then uh, we 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 kind of expanded on that um, during the during the following years. And before I joined Nvidia, I had a company in virtual reality called uh, Realities. Um, we can talk about a little we bit more. We will talk about that later. Yeah. Um, we were in the United States, in Silicon Valley. Um, that's where we set up the company, and we we visited Nvidia at some point. Okay. And. It was great because we came in there and suddenly there were plenty of people around us from the virtual reality team. And for us, back then, we were just three dudes from Germany setting up a company. <laughs> wow. and, and coming into the NVIDIA headquarters and seeing that there's like a huge team of people working on that topic was just was, was really great. And NVIDIA, fortunately, is not the only company that's working on that. So there's a, there's a bunch of companies um, from Google to Facebook to Amazon um, to Dell, Lenovo, HP, Acer, you name it. There's so many companies working in VR right now. And this is, this is really, it's, it's really great from a... Um, from an enthusiast perspective. Perfect, really nice. So um, I'm wondering now in your in your current job or in general, how close does NVIDIA work together with Oculus, for example, or with HTC or probably with Valve in working on new headsets or in working on new, new standards? Well, we can also directly talk about the virtual link standard. How does yeah. something like this happen? Um, it's a very, it's a very good question. Actually, I wanted to use Virtual Link as one of these, as one of these examples. Perfect. Um, because for, for those of you who don't know, um, Virtual Link is essentially a dedicated port on future, on our future GPUs and on our current, so the Turing GPUs, all of those that 2070, 2080, 2080 Ti, and also the new Titan. Um, they all have a Virtual Link connector, and. I'm, I'm going to quickly explain what it does and then why this is such a great thing for the industry. So the, the thing that it does is, for those of you who have set up a virtual reality headset, that's probably many, um, you usually need three cables, right? You need one for data, you need one for uh, display, and you need one for power. And that all goes, t typically tradition goes into a link box, some kind of link box, and that then uh, puts, puts that into one cable and, and brings it to the headset. But um, this is not really the easiest setup for virtual reality, right? In, in, a, in an ideal world, you just have one cable, you plug that into your desktop or your laptop, and it just works. And this is something, this is something that needs to happen for broad mainstream adoption. All those technical hurdles of where do I put this cable, how do I set this up, why does it not work, those, those points of failure, they really need to go for virtual reality to become this broad technology. And that promise is in virtual link. So the, the new GPUs have a, a port and, the, and future virtual reality headsets will have just one cable that you can plug into that one port and fingers crossed, it just works. <laughs> um, this, is, this, is, this is something that was, that is a, a thing that's very important for the industry as a whole. And so what we've done is we've come together um, with Valve and HTC um, and Oculus to make a consortium called um, co uh, called the Virtual Link Consortium. And it is there to make sure that Virtual Link is an open standard and it's something that's not proprietary, where we say, hey, guys, use this, and AMD yeah. says, use that. <laughs> and the great thing about this is this, that AMD is also on board with this. And, and recently, HTC also joined this consortium. Right. So there's a, there's a broad, there's, there's a broad unification within the virtual reality industry to make sure that those important topics are really happening. And, and this also, again, makes me so happy as a VR enthusiast. Companies kind of put aside their, their, their main business reasons and they come together to make sure that the, that, that the end user has the best experience. And Virtual Link is one of those examples. For that. So that's how we work together with those with those people and, and with those companies. And it's obviously it's a complicated thing, right? Yeah. Everybody has their own wishes. Exactly. Everybody wants their own standards. What length should the cable? What length of cable should we support? How yeah. much power do we support over the, that uh, that this, that virtual link port? 
those things have like there's many many meetings that have to happen for everybody to come together and say okay this is what we're doing and and the same thing the same thing happens on the marketing sales side so um when htc for example has or, or oculus has a bundle with games then we can also support that from our side where we're saying hey if you buy a vr hmd plus a gpu you get the, these five games on top of that those are like examples for marketing campaigns where we're just working together and then um you kind of talk to them let them know about the idea you nail down on the basics and then you go out talk to your channel partners so that it, it, it um the, the bundle is being reflected on many websites out there it's very much piecing together um, nice activities, making sure that we're working together constantly. And then obviously a huge part is the technical side. So whenever whenever um, Oculus or HTC come up with a new uh, HMD prototype, they send one over to us so that we can make sure that our driver pipeline and our rendering pipeline is very much aligned with what the company wants to do. And just to name one more example, it's um, Star VR, Pimax, or, or um, uh, VR engineers. They all have headsets that have m more than two panels, and the rendering for those, so rendering on scanted displays, is what it's called, as if those displays, so there's, there's two in front, and then there's two on the sides that are slightly uh, angled. And um, rendering for those kind of things is a little bit of a tricky one. And with Turing, so with our new uh, 20 series of GPUs, we're actually supporting a system called multi-view rendering. So you can naturally render or naturally render to those displays. So again, this is one of those examples where Star VR said, hey guys, we would love to have a system where we can render to multiple viewports, not only two, but many, maybe four or even more. Then we go back to our driver team and to our engineers and say, hey, is this something that we can support? And then in the end, it, it comes back to comes back to Star VR or Pimax to put that into their SDKs so that it all runs smoothly. So it's very much working closely together with these guys to make sure there's no bugs and to make sure that the VR experience for the end user is super smooth one. Wow, it sounds amazing. It sounds like you're piecing together the VR industry, actually. Like the pieces come together uh, at your office. <laughs> it's, so as, as much as I would like to say that it's, it's mostly on NVIDIA side, it's, it's something that you really have to say about the VR industry is everybody's working together. Yeah. We're so early on that every single thing you do feels like pioneering work, you know? And, and so the, the, the willingness to work together on something like virtual link where Nvidia is coming together with AMD, right? Our main competitor. Yeah. Coming together and making sure that this is something that is that, that helps future generations of VR headsets to come together. This is something that is really great about the VR industry. There's not people aren't like this. Yeah. They're usually like yeah. this where they're trying to help each other it's and, and just trying. It's it's a funny thing where as the virtual reality cake grows, you know the individual pieces will grow as well. Right. So at first, we gotta make sure that the, the cake is as big as it gets, so the VR industry is as big as, as it gets. And if we can do that, then the individual market share that people have will also be will also be higher than that. So essentially, it's very much making it happen first, and then we're fighting our market share. Right, wow, It's it sounds very interesting. And I, would you agree that at the moment the industry, since it's so so young and fresh, it feels a bit magical that everybody knows, hey, we're working on something special, and that we are in the very beginning of that? It is. It is very much like that. Yeah. It, it really feels like the very early days. Right. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the talk by Michael Abrash on at Oculus Connect, it's called "These Are the Good Old Days," yeah. and right. it really it really is like you you've seen it obviously. It's yeah. it's one of my favorite talks in, in virtual reality. Because it really, it really gives you a feeling about how early on we are. Yeah. Like we're so early that um, we're still thinking about things like how does the head strap work? <laughs> um, right. How big can a VR headset be? How does input work? Like those very basic questions that, right. that people in 20, 30 years down the line they won't think about it because it's just natural. Just like, just like how you how you um, control a car, for example, right? It's just. It's a mechanism that has been tested and tried over the last couple of decades. Right now, it's a standard. You have a steering wheel, you have a gear shift, you have brakes, you have a, a um, you have a clutch. 
all of these things are just they're just very natural. But in the early days of the automobile, it was it, like, there was nothing. People were literally trying things out, and then some cars had a wind wiper, a windscreen wiper. Some didn't. It was just it was just very very much the wild west of the automotive industry. This is where we are in right now with virtual reality. People are just now laying the foundation for many many years to come of virtual reality experience. And this is this is something that where where I draw a lot of motivation from working in this industry and. and that even if you have just a tiny impact on the virtual reality uh, world right now, that can grow into something really, really big in the future. And actually, actually, the guys from from Hologate, where I'm where I'm at, are a, are a great example for that. Where it's the very early days um, of entertainment systems in virtual reality. Right. So what these guys are what these guys are building, just really quick for those who are wondering what's behind me. Yeah. This is a four this is a four player virtual reality system, and you can you can buy it and then put it into your family entertainment system, family entertainment center essentially. So, for example, if you're the owner of a bowling alley, or if you have a, an entertainment center, if you have a cinema, um, and you want to add virtual reality to your product to your product portfolio, then those guys are essentially giving you the chance to to buy that off the shelf. So it's a four player it's a four player system. They have their own games. And they needed to figure out so many of these early things. Like, for example, um, in this in this case, the they have an overhead system for the cables, right? Right. And just just making sure that that overhead system for the cables is working really well was pioneering work. They essentially tried out different zippers, different different lines, different wires, and to make sure that those kind of things, like this, the, those tiny little details that. In 10 years, nobody will ever think about again because they're more or less from the past. Those are the things that you have to think about right now, and it's it's just tiny things, and it's it's also things like the the screen up there. So if there's a game going on with with four people down here, yeah. the screen up there shows a fifth camera, so that outside viewers can see what's right. happening inside of virtual reality, right. which is obviously important because otherwise there's just four guys standing there <laughs> doing weird things. Right. This way, somebody from the outside can actually see what's happening on the screen, and. It might sound, might sound like a total no-brainer, right? But those are all the things that you have to think about when you're doing early virtual reality games. It is unbelievable, really. Tiny, tiny, tiny details. That's, yeah. that's what, what really makes working in the VR industry so great right now. Fantastic. It is really the, the wild west of virtual reality. It I is. think you said that very well. Nice. So um, still, I would like to speak a bit about the virtual link a bit more because it's just yeah. so interesting, right? It's just like, wow, the future is going to be one cable. We just plug it in. It's going to be much better. I mean, uh, probably we watch this in five or ten years and we think, oh, shit, we needed some cables, right? But now at the moment, yeah. it's pretty cool. <laughs> and um, I'm wondering, like, one company must have been the leader for this. Was it NVIDIA who said, OK, guys, we need this now. Let's make this standard happen. Or from who, who took initiative for that? It was really, it was really everybody uh, coming together. So okay, cool. it was spare, it was spearheaded by Nvidia. So we started, we started the initial discussions. But from that, and I, I don't want to take too much, um, too much limelight for Nvidia. Yeah. This was very much, like I said, the people coming together. So okay, cool. it was. Nvidia is, Nvidia is somebody that has the capacity to drive discussions like this, right? We can go out and we can we can do a commitment where we say, hey guys, we're actually gonna use this port on our future GPUs. So we kind of we kind of put this out in advance. Right now, there's no headsets that support virtually, but there will be in the future. But it's this chicken and egg problem, right? Where if there's no headsets that don't support it, then um, it doesn't make sense to have it on a GPU if there's headsets that support it, but no GPU has it. It's very much a chicken and egg problem. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the thing is, sometimes somebody just has to make a, a bold step. And in this case, it was Nvidia starting and driving this, starting and driving this discussion. Um, and, but very much after that, immediately, um, AMD, HTC, many other people, many other of the companies came on. Valve came on as well. Um, Valve is very much a leader with SteamVR and so on and so forth. And um, so this was this was a, a unique thing that was done by the by the VR industry. Wow, incredible! It's really nice to hear that 
everybody is working together everybody w simply wants to advance the whole industry and yeah just make the cake bigger in the beginning before everyone starts to fight over the pieces that is really cool that's really nice to hear great um yeah so um well uh, probably you cannot say it right now but do you already know which headset is going to be the first to use this port um, I unfortunately can't comment on any on any partners, yeah. any partners timelines. Right, that's what I thought. Yes, but probably and I, I obviously also can't make I also can't make any promises. But there's as as you know there there's big names like HTC and Oculus on there. Obviously, this is not it's, it's not any type of commitment or yeah. any type of product announcement from them. But them being on that consortium, you can put one and one together. Yeah, of course. And, 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 and then the, there's other companies like Star VR and VR engineers who are very much in line with that. And also the guys from um, from um, many other companies. We're, we're, we're talking to them, yeah. but none of them have any any products committed yet. Okay. So this would, this would be me taking away the limelight from our partners, and I sure. can't do that. Sure. Good question, though, Sebastian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> right now, right now, we're actually getting we're actually getting a little bit of action in the background. All right. Yeah. So, uh, for those of you, for those of you who are, who are wondering what what Hologate is, this is essentially what they're what they're building here. Nice. So um, you have a haptic vest, this little haptic vest that essentially gives you um, haptics. It's it's the B haptics vest for those uh, who have tried it already. And then you have Vive Pros um, dangling from this wire system on the on the top. And then essentially it's four players. It's easy in, easy out. There's not a lot of, there's no setup that you have to do. Essentially, you can just go there and play around a virtual reality with your friends, which is obviously something that's also very important for the VR industry, right? Because exactly. people can just come in, they put on a headset, no hassle, no setup, nothing. They just go in and play, um, play that system um, in a very easy manner. Yeah, that's also important if you put this into an arcade or a cinema, you want to have like lots of throughput, right, to generate most uh, most money. So that's that's cool. Very nice. And is it like that Hologate also, they, they made their own games? Uh, yes, that's right. They, make, right. Their, they yeah. make their own games. Oh, so yeah, exactly. what, they're, what they're doing is, um, what they're doing is, and just give me one second. Yeah. It's only too loud. There's a podcast going on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Podcast, guys. <laughs> right, we'll, 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 try, we'll try this. I'm just okay. going to put this uh, microphone a little bit closer to me. Yep, I think and so. And let live know that they... <laughs> <laughs> well, but at least there's some action going on in this podcast. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's that's literally the reason why I came here because I want like I know I've I've, I've seen a lot of your podcasts and even your, even your studio looks so professional. Right. So I want uh, I wanted to have something cool going on, something cool VR it's nice. going on. And it's it's nice. It's well, very nice. I hope, this, I hope I hope the viewers of this podcast and the listeners uh, they can they can stand a uh, little bit of background noise yes, for the I next couple of minutes, but then you have... I think so, because <laughs> because the content is so good, they will be happy to yeah have some noise. It's okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, definitely this is going to be very interesting to see with the, with the new standard. Yeah, which is going to be the first headset. We'll see yep. about that. Well, um, yeah, so I'm wondering if uh, I'm a new headset maker, let's say I'm going to make, uh, for some reason, I'm going to make the MRTV headset. <laughs> and and I, would, I, want, I want to use uh, that standard. How would I go about it? Is, it? is it easy for new manufacturers to just join that consortium and to use that port? So it's, 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 um, there's two ways of, of getting access to this. The first one is proper membership in the consortium. And this is obviously, there's obviously a little bit more involved. So it's, it's a little bit of a, for more complicated ones because it's, um, it's, an open, it's an open standard. So there's lots of like paperwork essentially that you have to fill out. You have to commit to a certain, um, to a certain um, amount of time that you're putting into the consortium. But apart from that, um, there's a second way which makes it super easy for any headset manufacturer, and that is um, the, the standard, the implementation is an open standard. Okay. So you can literally go, you can literally go to uh, virtuallink.org, um, which is uh, which is the website of the consortium. You can download the specifications, and then you also have um, contact details for those people um, that need that, that like 
basic overview of what the specification is there. It's, um, it's free for everybody. Everybody can download that. And then if you need guidance on top of that, um, there's ways to get in, in contact with the consortium without um, needing to be a member. But obviously, if you're, if you're becoming a member, then you have more saying in the kind of direction, okay. the kind of direction that Virtual Link might be going to. And um, if you're just somebody that wants to implement the technology in your future VR headsets, um, this is something this is something that you can easily do um, through this advanced overview that, that everybody can that everybody can uh, see on the website. All right. Okay. Cool. Great. Good to know. Right. So um, the People Next Up podcast is not just about the things that people do, but it's also very much about the people themselves. So I really would like to go to the next stage now of our talk, and I would like to get to know you, and I would like to get to know. Uh, about your career path. How did you get to become the the head of VR in Europe at NVIDIA? And uh, I think it would be very interesting if you could let us know a bit how you got where you are right now. Sure, uh, more than happy to do that. So I'm, I'm essentially a huge gaming enthusiast. Um, I've started my career um, at a publishing house for entertainment and mostly for video games, which is called Computech. It's one of the largest um, publishing houses for entertainment and for immersive entertainment in, uh, in in Europe, and they are they are producing magazines, websites, and um, about games, about gadgets, about entertainment. And back then, I was working for for a, a magazine called um, Games Games Aktuell. Mm -hmm. um, for those German readers that, that might know that, and Games Aktuell is. Um, is not only about games, but also a lot about net culture, gadgets, new iPhones, just tech in general, right? Yeah. And so, and so back when I was back when I was working there, I had the chance um, to try an early prototype of the Oculus Rift, wow. and it was literally it was literally one of those super early prototypes that was held together with duct tape. And I was I was in a very lucky situation that that was Gamescom 2012 back when the Kickstarter was still running for the Oculus Rift, and um, I learned about it on Reddit and I I, I I I I soaked up every piece of information that I could get because suddenly there's a Kickstarter video with Gabe Newell in there, Cliff Blashinsky, Michael Abresh, and I'm like, wait, this is is this. Is this a real thing? Like, does this thing really work? And so I, I read a lot about um, about the experiences, and everybody was like, "Holy shit, this is so great! This is this is something you can't imagine. You have to try it out yourself." And so during Gamescom 2012, I learned that um, Paul Malaki and Nate Mitchell they were at Gamescom promoting the duct tape prototype of the Oculus Rift, and I learned that only one week in advance or so. I text, I, I, I sent the messages saying, hey guys, I work for Computech. We have millions of readers. Can I please try this headset? And they're like, ah, dude, I'm so, we're so sorry, but we can't do it. And so I, I kind of gave up on that. Not quite though, because I sent them another mail saying, guys, I know you're only here once in Germany. Like I need to try this now or, or like I can't, I, I'm, I, was just, I was just very enthusiastic about trying it. And so Palmer and Nate, they squeezed me into their lunch break. Oh, nice! So they, literally, they put on they put on the headset, and it was running the, the the legendary Doom 3 version from John Carmack, the one that was never really released, but it was the earliest tech demo that they've done. So they put me in there, uh, gave me a gave me a controller in my hand, and sat on the side just eating their lunch while I was just roaming around on Mars on a on a on a, on a space station on Mars. And I still I still remember this, and this is probably something that many other viewers of this podcast can um, can imagine. My first VR experience, it was just, it was totally mind-blowing. So I went in there with super high expectations and I still remember this very vividly. The first, the first moment they put on the headset and they gave me the controller, I, I, I stood in a, in a hallway on a space station on Mars and my first like natural reaction was I tried to walk forwards with my own legs. Right. Until I realized that it's not possible because back then things didn't have positional tracking. Right. And and the fact that this technology tricked my brain, so I was I, I knew that I was standing and I knew that I couldn't walk with my own feet. Like I've, I've read up on that, all of that. But still, my body wanted to move forward. That was just it was just 
eye-opening for me. And um, ever since then, I this was literally my 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 birth as a PR evangelist. Wow. And I told everybody about it. I I told every everybody about it. I told my girlfriend about it. I told my friends about it. Um, and I really thought. Hey, what can I do to make to, to tell more people about this? How can I make sure that as many people as possible try this and that it becomes a thing? And so one of the one of the I was I, I was and I still am a huge Reddit user. I understand that I understood that Reddit is it's a traffic powerhouse. If a topic, any kind of topic, has a place and a forum on Reddit, there's an automatic automatic um, reach and automatic visibility for that kind of topic. And so I, I, I helped start uh, the, the Oculus community on Reddit and I was one of the one of the earliest moderators and I was really the power user there. I was just a huge nerd. I, I read everything about virtual reality back on those obscure forums like NTBS 3D. Like back in the days there were like very obscure places. Sometimes Palmer posted something here. Sometimes John Carmack gave a speech there and you really had to pull all of this together. And so because I was I was reading up on the topic anyway, I just took all of these links and put them into the subreddit. Amazing. So I was I was by far the user that just put in the most content into into this subreddit, into this community. Because I I've I've done I've I've helped grow a couple of other um, uh, subreddits before, so I had a little bit of experience in how to get this community of how to get this ball rolling on the community. Because I wanted that virtual reality has one central place that you can go to and read up on everything that's happening in VR. And back then it wasn't a lot. Like back then there was like two things that you could post every day, max. Sometimes there were days where nothing happened. But making sure that there's a place where people can come together and start an early community was, I think, was, was very important for the, for, for, the, for the early VR market because we, we, back then we were like 50 people but it was it was just a very highly curated crowd. The Palmer was posting every day, and people from Oculus were posting every day. Um, it was just a very curated crowd, and it, fe it felt like a very strong starting point of something big, you know. And we were dreaming about, wow, imagine Skyrim in VR, or <laughs> imagine racing games in VR, and. and Five years later, you can have all of that in VR, and I and I am very proud of the fact that this community that we started back then has grown from this 50 nerds, 100 nerds, 1,000 nerds into a community of almost 150,000 people right now. Amazing. So this this is something that 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 I'm super super happy about, and I'm super proud of. And this is this is that, that was that was literally just me thinking, hmm, how can we help? How can we help this topic? How can how can I make sure that many game developers know about this? And that was that was and, and this this wasn't only me. Much of this this was also done by the other moderators, like Wormslayer, for example. He's a, he's he's such a such a such a nice guy and such a such a driver of this early community. Um, that that it's it's we're very proud of that of those kind of things. And, wow, incredible. And one, of, one of the other things, just just as a quick one to, to yes. just wrap up my community background. Yes. Um, I also believe, strongly believe, that virtual reality is something that you have to experience. You, you can talk, I can talk hours on end about what virtual reality can do and how immersive it is and how you're suddenly feeling like you're in another place. You really have to put headsets on people's faces for them to understand. <laughs> I mean, preaching to the choir here, probably. Yeah, and exactly. so one, one other thing I did was I started a, a virtual reality Germany meetup group and organized the, the one in Munich myself. So it was, it was just a place where people that didn't have access to virtual reality hardware, they can come, they can try out VR, they can listen to talks from the industry, and it's just, it's just another, another venue of uh, um, building communities, this time local, so that you can start off a, an industry in your, local, in your local communities. And that in turn grew into something bigger, where um, the meetup organizers from different places, so from, um, from um, Netherlands, from Spain, from uh, Brussels, from Belgium, from Germany, from, and from, from other places, we all met up in, uh, I think it was July 2015, we met up in Paris and started, started realizing that all of our meetup organizers, we have the same kind of issues how to get budget for the meetups, how to find speakers, um, how to find companies that are in your, in your country. And, and so we, we realized that we can work on those issues together and started a nonprofit organization called euvr.org, um, which is essentially it's an umbrella organization 
for the European virtual reality ecosystem. And this is something totally voluntary, it's something we did on the side. And, um, this is, it's, a, it's a place where we were trying to, we are, we are connecting the European virtual reality industry. So those are, all of this is kind of my community background where I believe that you make something happen by people talking amongst each other and coming together and sharing this, sharing this crazy enthusiasm. Wow, this is incredible. So Dominic Escoffier very much being like one of the community builders in VR, actually. If you, think, if you think about it, amazing. It's, I'm, I was just trying to do my, my small thing. And the funny thing is now in hindsight, yes, it turned into this huge community on the internet and it turned into a nonprofit organization. Right. Back then, we just we didn't think about it that way. Back then, it was literally just 100 nerds <laughs> thinking about the future of VR and how can we make this a thing. And it was just, it was just, we were, we were constantly like pushing each other, um, just trying to, trying to make this into a, into a bigger thing. Fantastic. So, are you still active in the Oculus subreddit now? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm still one of the, I'm still one of the head moderators. Um, I don't do, I, I don't get too much in the trenches these days. <laughs> um, at some point, at some point, we got, uh, we, we had a huge influx. So when. When the price announcement happened, and also when the launch happened in early 20 in early 2016, the the, the users exploded of that subreddit, and so we also got tons of new moderators on board that are now they, they have different functions within the community, and so I, I do still do um, uh, work there, but mostly high level stuff like hey, what are we gonna do about this broader topic? And then I bring in my expertise, but I'm very very thankful. For those um, for those moderators who were willing to spend their time and help out uh, in making sure that it, it is a community that doesn't become too toxic, because those people who have been in the internet on the internet a bit before, yeah, sometimes online communities can become a bit toxic. Yeah, right. It's, Reddit can become pretty pretty toxic sometimes, right? But um, actually, I found out uh, if I post something on Reddit that has lots of information and that doesn't want to draw people to a website or a video, then people will love it. But yeah. if, it's, if, yeah. it's, if it's too obvious, like, hey, watch my video, wow, they will they will hate the, the friggin' shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it makes sense. Just provide value and I think you're gonna be good on Reddit. <laughs> yeah, cool. So very interesting. I, I also believe that th this kind of community building work, it has supplied you with lots of amazing connections, right, in the industry. Definitely, definitely. It was it was extremely nice getting to know uh, many of these many of these people, and it was it was really funny because in in the early days in 20, 2012, so we started the, 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 the community in twenty twelve. Um, we were just like a hundred, two hundred users. There were right. people, Cymatic Blues on there, who was one of the earliest YouTubers um, um, about virtual reality. He had Alt Space VR. Alt Space VR. There you go, and. Knowing these people only from the online communities, but then later on, um, when I when when when, you, when we started the startup called Realities um, .io, we went to Silicon Valley with that with that company to set it up there, and then getting to know all these people that I have known from my online persona in real life, it was just so nice because people were coming up to me, hey, your doodle sack on Reddit, oh my god, this is amazing, like. So great to see you, and everybody was so. It was hard. It was really heartwarming to see um, the people in the VR industry, both both on the online side and then during my time in Silicon Valley, in person and, and getting wow. the feeling. I, I think so. That that's really amazing. Once you meet them in real life, and wow, incredible. So yeah, yeah. but but let's go step for step then. So yeah. you've been working at Computech in Germany, working for for this magazine. You got your first. Uh, VR eye-opening experience when you tried the device, you helped to build the communities. What was your next step? I thought you, so probably you want to get even deeper into the rabbit hole. Um, yes, I did want to get deeper into the rabbit hole, but, it, but I was, um, to be honest, I was following it kind of from the sidelines at first. Um, right. And this is, a, this is a bit of a tricky one. So um, I'm, I, was, I was pushing awareness, or I tried to push awareness as good as I, I could. So one thing I did is I convinced the magazine that I was writing for, the publishing house, to, to buy a DK1 and to make sure that they're reporting about it, right? They're putting up articles, they're, they're sharing a story, and so on and so forth. Um, but, and, and for those of you out there who have worked with the DK1 and the DK2, it was a very promising technology, 
but I was, I was still, it was this tiny bit of skepticism where I thought, is this going to become good enough to become mainstream, to become a thing? Because back in the days, and I'm very much susceptible, I'm very much susceptible to motion sickness. Right. Back in the days when during the DK1 times, literally everything made you motion, motion sick. Like yeah. if you somebody that's, that's very sensible to, towards that, which I am, then every single thing you tried made you sick. Yeah. And I was, Lots of people puked at that time. Actually, one of my friends, one of my friends actually, actually did that. <laughs> but he might have had a beer or two before yeah. trying. Yeah, sure. yeah, probably. Sure. It sure. happens in Germany so. sometimes. Yeah. Um, but apart, like, even if it wasn't that crazy, like even if you didn't have to run to the, to the restrooms, it just made you a little bit uneasy. Like it was, it wasn't, it was, it was a great experience visually and, and from the way it made you feel part of those sceneries, right? right. But it also, there also was this bit of skepticism in my, in, in the back of my head where I was like, ah, is this really gonna, is this really gonna, be, gonna become as good as I think? So I kept working in the, I kept working in the, in the games industry, but also had like my, my, my foot in the door with virtual reality. And then uh, late 2013, I switched uh, to a PR and marketing role at Rockstar Games. So I was working on uh, GTA 5 mostly. We were doing, uh, we were doing uh, marketing, sales, PR for the German-speaking countries. And so working on like, like one of the, or the biggest entertainment product in the world was just crazy because on one side we had these multi-million sales for GTA 5 and on the other side there was this tiny topic called virtual reality so I was very much in between those in between those things and what made me finally pull the trigger to go all in with virtual reality was when I tried the HTC Vive mm -hmm. um, the first prototype of the HTC Vive came around in uh, the summer of 2015 and um, uh, a friend of mine that I had known from, from the meetups, he had a virtual reality, he had an HTC Vive dev kit. And the first time being able to walk around and use your hands at the same time, it was just, it was just magical. That was my moment when I thought, okay, this is, it's really going to become a thing. This is, this is something that is, it is good enough. <laughs> that I can put it on my mother's face, for example, and give the controllers in her hand, and she immediately understand what it does. Before that, during the DK1 times and the DK2 times, what you, what I always did is, I always explained a lot. I had, I explained a lot about, hey, the resolution is gonna become bigger. The motion sickness is gonna go, is gonna go away because there's things like positional tracking. Like, in the early days, people understood what it is, but you had to explain a lot. With the HTC Vive, there was no explanation needed. You just put it on their faces, you gave them a controller, and apart from like the controls, you didn't have to explain it. It was literally, hey, you look around, you walk over there, you, pre you, you grab things with your hands. It was very easily understandable. And that was the, that was the time when I realized, okay, this is, it's, it's, it's gonna happen. This is, this is re it's gonna happen. It's never gonna go away any, any, anytime soon. And that's when I started thinking about um, what I would love to do in virtual reality. And that's when um, Realities happen. Realities, for those of you who haven't played it, it's a free app on Steam um, where you can visit real places in virtual reality. And the, 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 the good thing about this is, is that it's not, it's not 360 video where you can also visit other places. It's done with a technology called photogrammetry. And Photogrammetry, just as a very quick one, it's a, it's a, it's a technology where you take lots of photos um, from, from a scene that you, so let's say a prison cell in Alcatraz or a German castle, for example. You go to that site, you take hundreds to thousands of photos, you run those photos through a photogrammetry pipeline, and then in the end what you get is an ultra photorealistic rendering of that world. And it's not like it's not like your it's not like a 360 video where you can only look around on one particular place, right? It's a full 3D model. So if it's a German castle, for example, you're not bound to the perspective of the camera. You can actually move around in that whole in that whole area and explore a place freely. And for me, that was just it was just mind blowing. Like it was the, the ability to capture a real scene. And then view it through virtual reality was for me, and it still is, a super promising technology. 
And I first got in contact um, through that um, through that buddy of mine who had who had the early HTC Vive prototype. He was doing photogrammetry for archaeology purposes. So he was really an archaeologist. So two electrical engineers and an archaeologist come together and they make a VR company, right? Um, Amazing. And this is this is something this is something. So he had these he had these crazy detailed models of archaeological sites, right? And he didn't he didn't know what to do with them. And so he thought, well, virtual reality is the perfect way. Like suddenly you're not looking at it on a on a on a flat screen. Suddenly the scene is all around you. The photogrammetry is happening all around you. And that was that to me was super promising. And so I I, I started um, started conversation with him, and we were just throwing ideas around. Like, hey, what do you, what could you do? You could go to Chernobyl and, and scan it and then put it in VR and then suddenly you, you allow people that otherwise wouldn't ever be able to travel, right? Because they can't go on a plane, because they're bound to a wheelchair. Suddenly virtual reality allows those people to see places that they otherwise could never see. Like for example, Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is there's thousands of steps that you have or hundreds of steps that you have to go up. Many, many people just can't do that. It's a privilege to travel. And you can take that privilege to the people and make them make them experience places in in uh, virtual reality that that are one to one like the real thing, and that's when that's that's how all this how this whole idea started. And we brought another another um, partner on board, uh, a neural uh, a, sorry a cognitive scientist, um, to help us with the UX and UI. He was working for um, for. Um, projects with Audi before, for example, making a virtual car configurator. His name is Daniel Sproul. And with our, with, with my, with my other colleague uh, called David Finsterwalder, who's a, he, who, who was the, who is the, the photogrammetry expert. So it was literally three guys. We all quit our jobs. Um, we packed our bags. We went to Silicon Valley and we, we built a company there in an accelerator program called Boost VC. Boost VC? Yeah. It's, a, it's an accelerator program. Um, some of you might have seen uh, the, the, the uh, TV series, or net, I think it's a Netflix show called uh, Silicon Valley. Right, um, where it's a good show. It's, very, it's, it's actually very close to the real thing, where <laughs> we were also part of an accelerator program. So for those of you who aren't into the whole startup thing, just a quick explanation. When you set up a company in your very early stage, like we were, so we were three guys, uh, one business guy, one UX guy, one uh, technical guy, and um, you want to grow this company into something bigger. The first thing you need is money, obviously. So you need to buy things, you need to buy equipment, you need um, money to, to put into projects, to, to be able to travel with that, with that budget, and an accelerator program helps with that. So what they do is um, they give you a starting, capital, a starting funds for you to start your company, um, and for that, they take a small part of equity in your business. So they take essentially a partly a part, small ownership in your business. So they help you to kickstart um, your business from a financial standpoint. And then what Boost VC does, uh, did back then and still does, is they also give you free office space and free housing in the heart of Silicon Valley in San Mateo. Perfect, because living is not cheap there. It's it's really not cheap. It's expensive, so, uh, actually. Yeah. Young company, especially in, in VR, it was just great to be able to have um, a small amount of money, but also being able to not not spend money to, to be in the heart of the virtual reality industry because Silicon Valley, it's it's incompar uncomparable to anything else. The amount of capital that flows into virtual reality and the amount of talent that is in VR and the and the quality of the connections you make there was just absolutely insane wow. so that was really the main part that helped us kick off um, our company in silicon valley being part of that boost vc of that boost vc program and like i said meeting all those people that i had known from my from my from my community backgrounds and then meeting tons of new people from the br industry and every single person not not a lot of people made money but everything was like yes we're gonna do this nice it was, the spirit it was just very nice to be to be part of that um, because it was it was before the before the launch um, and shortly after the launch of the consumer headsets right. so it was from late 2015 to May 2016 so we've, we we were like 
during this time where everybody was like, oh my God, they're gonna launch, it's gonna happen. And then they launched and the, there was a pro that everybody was talking about the price because it was relatively high back in the days. Yes. And we were, we were part of that. Part of what really feels like a small, small part of the virtual reality history. It was, it was really great. Incredible. So I'm, I'm just um, trying to imagine how actually it really went down. So like three guys, three German guys, I don't know, probably you were in Munich or what. And then yeah. you thought, you thought like, you know what, guys, it's not going to happen here in Munich. <laughs> We need to go to Silicon Valley. So, <laughs> so, so did you like, um, did you like apply for several um, of these, of these um, booster companies, um, these accelerators? Like 500 startups or uh, what else? What else? Uh, lots of different ones. So back then, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, back then, there were only two major accelerators for virtual reality. Okay. That was Rosenberg and Boost VC. Those okay. were like top names. Right. And HCC now has an accelerator program on their own, which is called Vive X, yes. and that didn't exist back then. Mm -hmm. So there were only two really major ones. And we, we, when, you, when you're starting a company, you're thinking about where to get your first funds, right? Are you going to try to sell a product first? Are you going to do a bank loan? Are you going to go for, um, for venture capital? Um, it's really, we were like weighing the options really. And back then for us, it wasn't so important to get funds because all of us had the ability to put a small amount of funds into the company to run maybe the first year easily. Right. But then what we also, what was really attractive to us wasn't only the, the money, but also the kind, of, the kind of surroundings, the environment that we were in, right? That was very important for us because one thing that we realized back in the days, it was really hard to get proper feedback for your VR experiences because when you showed any type of VR experience, whether it was a shitty roller coaster or like a high-end photogrammetry experience, everybody took off the headset and was like, holy shit, that was the best thing I've ever seen. So, so getting like proper feedback for the, for the actual quality of your experience in Germany was really hard. Right. In Silicon Valley, the, the industry was much further advanced where you couldn't really, like you couldn't impress someone with Uh, with a bad VR experience just because it's their first time or their second time that they're wearing VR. They, there were people that have done, just like us, had done hundreds of VR experiences before. So you could get proper, honest, very constructive feedback on what you could do better, where to put your resources. That was very much important to us. And then obviously also the connections that we could make. So making connections to people like Road to VR, Upload VR, um, making connections to investors as well that was that was really why we decided that we want to be a in in a place where that is and that is that is in silicon valley and b at an accelerator that is focusing on virtual reality because we also had the option to go to a like a traditional let's just say a traditional tech investor right. like like um Y Combinator or? Y Combinator, yeah, Yahoo's, Yahoo's Y Combinator. Right. Those were, all, those were all options that we could have applied to, but we decided that we want to do something where we're really focused on virtual reality. And it was great. We were part of, we were part of the, the accelerator and there were 20, 20 other companies, 22, I think 20 other companies together with us, all small one person teams, one person to I think the biggest one was four person teams. And all of them are working, or most of them are working in virtual reality. So it was great to, to, to build a company while there's like 20 other people that are also building a company around you because you could learn from each other and you could, you could put, put in good words with your investors for them. And, and you really had the same kind of problems that those people had. So it was a, it was a very, very good environment that you can grow your company. And it was literally like that from, From within a time frame of five months, we managed to, like we were literally three guys from Germany with a prototype. In those five months, we managed to get follow-up investment from a Japanese investor. We managed to, to make the prototype into a product that we released for the launch of the HTC Vive. So we were really, 
this was something that I, I believe would never have happened if we weren't part of that accelerator program. Um, just because you get so much good influence, people help you, and you really have, you, 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 you also want to make them the, the most out of that time, right? So because if you're only there for three to six months, you really want to use that time. So we, besides sleeping and eating, there wasn't a lot we were doing, which also took its toll, obviously, on, on, on many people's uh, health because it was just it was just an insane amount of work. And also, you have to say that um, we worked like 16 hours a day, and all of that was in the basement of a of a, of an incubator. All so right. you came in there, and it was a great office, but then the accelerator was actually in the basement with really like any shimmer of sunlight coming in. So it was literally like in like in Silicon like in the, in the, in the show Silicon Valley where a bunch of nerds were sitting in the basement <laughs> building a future. Wow, did you have instant noodles? <laughs> yeah, we had so much ramen, you can't imagine. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> we were running, running on ramen and Red Bull, which might be part of the reason why we weren't the most healthy. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah but I, I also believe it's just the environment, like there's other companies who are also trying very hard to impress on demo day, right? On the on the very end, you, you have this limited time where you have to woo the investors. So there's so much going on. Right, you, you just have to work like crazy there, right? Yeah, you, it's also it's also something where the line very much blurs. Like you don't even think of it as, as so much work anymore. The the example you had with demo day was something where it felt like it felt like almost like a like a reality TV show, right? <laughs> right. Because at the end of it wasn't at the end of the program, but like one one month before the end of the program, everybody has their demo day. For those for those of you out there, the viewers or the listeners don't know what a demo day is. is in this accelerator program, you learn a lot. You you, you 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 work on your business models. You work on the on the promotion and the marketing and how you tell the story of your of your company. And um, and then in the end, lots of investors come in. Everybody, every CEO or the person that does the does the presentations usually, they get I think three or five minutes of time to do a pitch on stage in front of all the investors that are there. So you stand there as a young company that has barely has a prototype and tell people about how you're going to change the world essentially, right. how big the market is, um, what what kind of how how you're going to disrupt um, industries. And in our case, it was the travel industry, right? It, I I strongly believe that virtual reality will disrupt the travel industry because at at some point you can suddenly put on a headset and you can travel to other places, even if it's just virtually. This will change how people sell. Um, sell uh, vacations in the future, and so you stand there and talk about the travel market and and how big of a communal market it is and how how virtual reality will disrupt this, while you're not making any money and you're running off of a uh, rough of ramen and Red Bull. So it's a it's a it's a crazy situation that you're that you're in, but it was great. Like I and, and, and just to close this loop, it's it feels like the the. the the line between work and, and just things that are fun and things where you learn a lot, it really blurs because I learned so much about about business, about how to, how, what makes a good presentation, um, lots of legal stuff. And then, and then obviously also I learned, I learned a lot about myself because being like taken out of my comfort zone, right, in Germany at Rockstar Games, one of the biggest publishers in the world, to a very small startup. Like leaving that comfort zone obviously makes you realize lots of things about yourself, what you want to do, the kind of team that you want to work with, and the, the, the people that you want to work with, the products that you want to push. Um, those are the kind of things that it was. A, it was a very, it was a super intense experience, um, but it was really, it was really one that I'm, that I, that I, I'm very happy that I had. It sounds like an amazing adventure. It sounds like an amazing was, adventure. Yeah, it was. And probably you could. Yeah, yeah. Probably you could um, to all the to all the people who are listening to this now or who are watching this and who are who have a great idea. Probably you would suggest them. Yeah, why don't you build like the the minimum viable product, right? That's the name in the in the startup industry. Make the make it so that it works, and then try to get into an accelerator program, right? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, so my tip my tip would be to. To, meet, to really meet as many people as you can first. Um, if, if, so, so I'm kind of a good example for that. I met my co-founder 
through the meetups I've, I've organized, right? So I was organizing those meetups and he came and held a talk there. That was the first time we, we talked to each other. And then, um, also goes back to your other question, the, the, the accelerator program, Boost VC, that we chose, um, came through an existing connection that I had already through the, also through the meetup space. Okay. So at some, at some point... So meet some, people. <laughs> It's meet people, talk, talk to people, yeah. and try to find people that are kind of on the same, on the same vibe as you are, right. because that's very, very important. Is if you have a great idea, and you might be the business person, you need a technical person to that that you're cool with, that that, that you can imagine to work with for a long time, right? Because building a company that takes a little while. Um, make sure you're on the same, you have the same vibe. And, and, and meeting those people is really important. So to, to, to tell you the story of Boost VC, I was um, organizing the meetup in Germany. It was called Virtual Reality Germany. And at some, at some point I got a message on meetup.com from Boost VC. And I, back then I didn't know about it. It was, yeah. an, it was a guy called uh, Chef Wasson texting me saying, hey, I've heard so many great things about virtual reality in Germany and in Europe, but I can't find any companies to invest in. Can you help? Yeah, well, I just made no, no, this company. Wait, wait. wait. Back, funny enough, funny enough. Back then, I wasn't working in VR yet. So back okay. then, I was, I was right. working at Rockstar Games. But I still was like, oh my god, that, that can't be. Like, how can it be that a that a that a investor from the US wants to wants to put money into the into the VR ecosystem, and there's nobody here. Like, he can't find people. And so right. I. I did this mostly because I wanted I wanted this money to, to go into the European ecosystem, right? Um, I I contacted all my contacts on Facebook, on the Facebook groups, on the meetup groups, on Reddit. I did lots of promotion for the Boost VC program because I felt that this is something that's very important. This is something that that the industry needs, right? We need a cash infusion. We need deal flow. We need investors talking about those kind of topics. So I did this mostly as kind of like a I wanted to help the people out there in the VR industry. I, I didn't expect anything back. And that was actually funny because two two weeks later or two days later, Jeff sent me another message saying, hey dude, that was so amazing of you. Thanks for putting putting that message out. Many There were so many people applying because of the message that you put out. Great. And, and he, said, he said, if I can do something for you in the future, um, then let me know. And I said, dude, you can pay me a beer if you want to. I don't expect any, I don't expect anything back, yes. right? Back then, back then, I didn't even think about it. But when we started our company, I, I talked to my co-founder and I was like, "Hey, I know this. I know this investor right. from the UK. Right? We, I mean, we can we can ask him. We can talk to him and see if they're interested." And they were like super interested. They were like, "Holy shit! You're three guys. You already have a prototype. Um, you already quit your jobs. You're all in with this. Let's let's start a conversation." And they were so happy to, to be in contact with us that they actually um, invited us early to the to the Boost VC program. So we started, I think, one and a half months earlier than the other companies because they they, they just, you know, they, they knew me and they knew, they kind of had a feeling for, okay, this guy seems to have connections, right? He seems to be a person that is very much um, in the in the VR industry. Yes. And that, that helped me. So that, right. that brings me back to the tip is, meet people and then just i don't know if it's karma or something but i literally did this not not for hey maybe i might gonna use this in the future for my own benefit i was just like hey this this guy needs help right. and i have the means to help him let's just put one and one together and, and, and make this uh, make this a, a cool thing that's and, a, yeah and that's great advice end, yeah in the end, goes around comes around and he came back to us and Gave us our first, gave us our first money. And, um, yeah, we had the chance to go to, to Silicon Valley and, and, and experience the the height of the VR times there. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's a great advice. Just meet lots of people, help where you can, pay it forward, and yeah, just like you say, good things might happen, like yeah. in your case. Definitely. That's amazing. So. Um, then you, you got your follow-on funding and did you stay in, in the valley or did you come back to good old Germany? And uh, tell us a bit more how the story continued. Actually, actually, we, uh, we stayed a little bit longer in the valley. Uh, we raised a little bit of money, um, which for German terms, it's a, it's, it was actually a lot. So we raised half a million dollars from, uh, from an investment company called uh, Colopol. Um, and then, we, and then the, my co-founders also raised 
more capital after that. Right. So I think in total they they they, they, they doubled that up, but I'm I'm, I'm really not sure, um, because at that point um, we decided uh, to split ways because I had a I had a um, I had a, a job offer from Nvidia. They wanted me to run their European VR business. Well, the guys sounds also, good. <laughs> To, to be honest, it was a really tough decision. It, really, right. it definitely was a tough decision right. because at some at one point there's this startup that you put so much work yeah. into that you'd like to see like flourishing and grow and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, there's this this international company where you can probably have more impact on the whole VR ecosystem. And I'm very much an, an impact driven person. So it was it was really hard for me to see it was really hard for me to decide whether um, whether to take this this job or, or, or stay with the with the startup, but then they wanted to move to Berlin, and and there were a couple of a couple of, of reasons why I then decided um, to start working for Nvidia, and it was a really really hard decision, but in the end it felt like a place where I could actually have lots of impact for the European space because I could. I could make sure that people are aware that Nvidia is driving, is is very much driving this technology because we believe we believe in that, and and that in turn gives young VR developers and young VR companies more confidence because obviously if somebody like Nvidia, if AMD, if Google, if Facebook, all of them are are investing heavily into this future technology, probably there's probably there must be something behind it, right? Right. And so that was part of that was part of the reason why I felt that my my impact at Nvidia was was really cool, being able to help this European ecosystem grow and and, and give back a little bit to the community as well. And that's why I why I decided why I decided to take on that um, that role and take on that challenge. And yeah, that's what that's what uh, brings me here, I guess. It's cool, very cool, and it's um, also very interesting now to to talk a bit about. Um, about where VR industries are happening. You mentioned, like, of course, Silicon, Fa Silicon Valley, there's so much going on. But I must honestly, honestly tell you, with the people that I talk to here in the show, it's not just Silicon Valley. You can also be successful now in Prague, for example. I'm going to, to meet the, the VR engineers, right? Beat Saber, the most successful game is coming out of Prague. There's stuff happening. What is your take on this? It, it, makes, me, it makes me so happy. Um, <laughs> right. It, it really makes me happy because when we were in Silicon Valley, it it kind of, as a as a European, and I see myself not not really as a German, but like as a European citizen, like Same I grew here. up in Europe. Right. And for me, seeing seeing how quick, how fast the train was moving in Silicon Valley, as opposed to Europe back only like three years back, it was crazy to see. It was really. It was really breaking my heart to a certain to a certain degree where I saw people are getting funding, they're getting instant connections to Oculus. Right. They can walk into the, the headquarters of NVIDIA and walk out with GPUs like we did, right? <laughs> um, those are things that just didn't happen in Europe. And so seeing that now that we actually actually some of the biggest experiences and some of the market leaders are coming from Europe makes yeah. me so happy. MRTV is in Dortmund. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is, it's it's great. So the you already mentioned you already mentioned Beat Saber, which yeah. is probably the VR game right now. It's right. from it's Prague. Um, Star VR is and and, and Star VR is originally is originally a um, a European Swedish, company. Yeah. Right. And um, another another good example is Hologate right here. They are the the market leaders for location based virtual reality entertainment. They have three hundred systems sold. I think more than a hundred already set up. So, so they are the market leaders for this technology, and it's funny because it, I was at I was at Ayapa, which is the um, it's, it's the world's largest amusement and right. attractions expo exactly. in, in Orlando, Florida. Right. Um, it was crazy because the VR was everywhere, but the people that dominated the scene were these guys from from Munich, which was that's, just so great for me as a European. It's amazing. It's really amazing, and they and and, and they they did this. Without any venture capital, right? What? So they didn't take any. They didn't take any funds from anybody. They built this all themselves. And this is something. This is something where, at first, at first when I was in Silicon Valley, I thought, Oh my God, how is Europe ever going to catch up with the amount of capital? Just the amount of raw capital that goes into the industry was insane. Millions of dollars were going into building companies, right? So I thought 
there's no chance Europe will ever catch up with that. But Europe has a has one big one big thing is we think a little bit different about how to grow our companies. We think I, th I think we, we are more traditional when it comes to growing companies. Okay. So in, in, in the typical Silicon Valley model is you have a good idea, you have a team, and then you just throw money at it and grow it. You just want to outgrow everybody else. Whereas these guys, for example, they've built a system, they, they, they had an idea and they realized, okay, where is the market for this? Where can we, where are the actual the customers for this? So in Europe, you're, you're, you're thinking much more about building a product and selling it immediately as opposed to building a product and then keep building it until at some point the market catches up, right? Right. Which, which, means, that, which means that in the end, the US might have the bigger VR companies because they, 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 just, they just grow, 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 grow until they're just they're too big to fail. Yes. <laughs> Whereas in, in Europe, we are actually ahead of the curve right now in terms of revenue and in terms of companies that actually are self-sustainable. Right. So it's, it's it's a really good it's a really good mix, and this is this is one of the this is one of the examples where you can even without huge amounts of venture capital, you can build a company from the ground up and, and become a market leader. Wow, that's that's really super interesting and great to hear that things are going well here in Europe. And probably <laughs> you with your with with the job position, you you helped with that. Bring, I, I hope so. Weaving it all I, together. I hope so. <laughs> great, and then. Um, yeah, um, would you like to talk a bit probably uh, what's, what's next for you? What's in the cards for you in the future for your VR career? Um, that's, a very good, that's a very good question actually. Um, right now I'm, I'm still with NVIDIA and I'm, I'm still in their, in their role as the head of VR for, for Europe. But actually I'm right now in a, in a transitioning phase. So um, the part of the reason why I'm, why I'm transitioning to a different, um, to a different place is um, my, it's, it's, it's not the it's not the, the, the nicest reason for that, but um, one of my one of my close family members. So my dad has a, has a surgery in the next couple of days, and he needs to he needs to be taken care of a little bit. So he needs he needs support from the family. It's nothing life threatening, but he just needs somebody to be there right. and, and support him a little bit. Right. And I use I, I, I use this as kind of a kind of a reason um, to reorient myself um, because. So, so I'm taking literally, literally, I'm taking a sabbatical. So I'm taking half a year off first to, to, to take a little bit of time for the family to take care of my dad, where it's not sure how long it will take, but it will probably take a, a couple of weeks up to a couple of months. But then also to, to re-energize a bit. So uh, for those of you who are working in the VR industry, it's we're we're running very fast. Um, working there, you, you, the, the the fear of missing out, the FOMO. Is, insane in VR because if you're not going to an event you're always thinking of man damn I'm missing something and and it's really hard it's really hard to, to take time off of this topic so literally the last right. six years my life was all about virtual reality my girlfriends are working virtual. in virtual reality the events I've been to the travel I've done even during my vacations I went I went and and did things on the side for virtual reality. Right. Same I, I, really, I really want it's crazy. It's just crazy. Yeah. Like there's there's no time. Out. Nobody takes any breaks. And so I've realized this from looking at many of my peers, right, in the VR industry is some of them they just literally burned out. Like right. They worked so much and they were pushing this topic so hard and with so much enthusiasm that at some point at some point you kind of lose the fever a little bit and you need to take like you need to take a step back re-energize because virtual reality, it's not only the last couple of six years, it's gonna go on for such a long while. Right. So I've decided to, to, to use this family time as kind, of a, as, kind of a, as kind of a reason, take a step back, re-energize, reorient myself, and then see what the future brings. So I'm, don't, don't worry, you're not gonna get rid of me <laughs> anytime soon. I'm, I'm uh, talking to a couple of people in the, in the, in the XR industry um, about, about what they're, what they what they can imagine um, uh, to to happen in the future, and whether they can imagine me being part of their teams. Um, but right now, I'm I'm still super happy to have, have had the ability to work at to work at a place like Nvidia, and, and the people who have watched this whole podcast 
they've they've seen me speaking very positively about the about the company and about the things that they're doing, which I really believe. But now for me, it's kind of time to you know take a step back, reorient myself, and then um, yeah, go back into the next XR adventure. Wow, sounds incredible. Um, really, if cool. any of your viewers uh, wants to talk to me, then uh, oh yeah, I I'm, think there will be I'm some very visible on the internet. But Perfect. please not right now because. Otherwise, I'm yes. not going to take that break. <laughs> right, exactly. You should definitely enjoy the time off. And I'm sure that, Dominic, we're going to definitely see you again here on the show. But we're not yet ready because now we have we finished the part where we talk about you. I think the yeah. viewers and the listeners have a much better idea now who you are. And um, I think everybody is looking forward to hear more from you in the future. But now I would also like to get your take now on the industry i know it's a big topic of course and let's try to keep it uh probably within 10 minutes this talk because i know yeah. we could talk about this for another two hours yeah. but, but um we'll we'll keep that for the next time that you're on the show so i would like to ask you where do you see the vr industry now at the end of 2018. um i i actually think it's in a very healthy state so this is this is something this is something that I've been that's it's been on my mind a lot because I've I've lived through the hype, so to speak. Like I I've, I've been there at the maximum peak of the hype. Like suddenly everybody was talking about virtual reality, right? And but coming from coming from a background where we were literally a couple of nerds, again, we were a couple of nerds hanging out on the internet. And we for us back then, we, we couldn't have imagined that the VR industry is where it is right now, where there's multiple headset manufacturers, new headsets being announced every single year, big games coming for the platform. Like if you would have told that to me, that so many people, so many big companies are working in VR, if you would have told that to me five years or four years earlier, I would have probably not believed you. So coming from that background, it's crazy how far the how far the VR industry has come. It's really, really amazing to see that. So if if you just join in VR at the top of the hype, then you might have the feeling that things are like a little bit more quiet than they were before. But that's actually not true if you look at the at the statistics itself. So if you there was a there was a just recently the new Steam VR um, hardware survey came out right. where it showed that you had a good a good uh, uh, linear Right. Um, the linear growth in so like a steady, continuous growth in the amount of people that have VR headsets um, connected to their PCs. So VR is far from that. VR is still growing at a very healthy pace, and we will see down the line. And unfortunately, I can't talk about some of these things because I'm under NBA, and, and obviously I can't talk about any games or any products or any headsets that are coming out. But we all have an idea what might be coming out. Sorry, say again. But we have a good idea about the rumors, and I think we have an idea what you might be thinking about. But keep on, keep on talking. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, before I tell, before before I talk too much, there's a couple of things down the line: big games, big publishers, big headsets that are in production right now that I can't talk about, but that that make me very very happy about the future of VR. Like there's gonna be killer games. There's going to be new headsets um, that really will blow people's minds. Um, and then there's there's crazy high-end stuff like the Vario headset, for example. Just last week, I've been at, um, at Slush in Helsinki, which is a, a large investor co conference. And I was able to try the new Vario headset there. Um, Vario is a, it's a company from Finland. They're building a headset that has a very high-resolution part in the center of the phobia, so in the center of your vision. And it's it's they're on the verge of making it into a product so there's some things they still they, they still need to work on but in general it gives you a crazy glimpse of how future virtual reality headsets could be so all of that knowing all of that knowing that there's a continuous growth knowing that there's huge entertainment products on the on the horizon knowing all of these things makes me super optimistic for the bar. and that's that's part of the reason why i definitely why i'm definitely going to stay in the in the xr industry um, because I strongly believe that it's, yeah, it's, 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 there, it's there to stay. Great. So it's a very, very nice and very positive outlook of what's going to happen. And actually the state of the current VR industry, Dominic says it's not as bad as some people make it sound. And I can totally agree, especially with this hardware service that we see exactly that linear curve. It's, it's healthy, right? It's, there's nothing going down. People are excited about it. I think 
lots of awesome things on the horizon and that's the next question what do you think 2019 is going to bring us what in your opinion are going to be the big three topics the big three things that are going to happen in 2019 um, the, big, so the, the biggest one is definitely enterprise enterprise um, implementation of the technology. Like I, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, enterprises really, they understand now that they can save resources, save costs, have better training for their employees. They, and, and, but these things, they, they need time. In a, in a big corporate with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees, these things just take time. So 2019 will be the year, the year when um, we're reaping the benefits of what happened in 2016, 2017, when the headsets came out. People first had their VR experiences. They, they thought about what they could do in their, in their, in their companies with VR. And now you're, or in 2019, you see those things being rolled out on a wider basis. And I believe that we're going to get amazing killer games. So if you look at some of the games that are already announced, um, like um, Lone Echo 2, for example, right. Or, um, or uh, Stormland from, from Insomnia Games. I've tried some of these games in, in, in early versions, and they're just, just really good. And then on top of that, there's games that I can't mention that are also being that are also being worked on. Um, that makes that, that makes me really very hopeful for um, the virtual reality industry in 2019. And then the third the third big thing um, I think I would say we're seeing. We're seeing the, our first glimpses of eye-tracked virtual reality headsets. Um, coming from a technology background, I'm a very tech, I'm very much a tech person. I believe that in 10 years down the line, we we will not be able to imagine how headsets could have worked without eye tracking built in, because it's such a powerful, such a strong addition to virtual reality headsets. You can't like it, it's it's really hard. To grasp if you if you if you haven't seen the different applications of it. So what eye tracking what eye tracking allows you to do um, on one side is save on rendering performance. Right. So anytime you're in a VR headset, you're looking around with your eyes like this. Your eyes are getting tracked by camera systems. So you always know exactly where you're looking at, and that allows you to do a to, to use a technique called foveated rendering where you only render the part that you're actually looking at in full resolution and all the other parts in lower resolution, which saves performance, which allows you to run at a steady 90 frames per second or even higher by using clever rendering uh, tricks. So that's the performance side of things. But where I believe uh, eye tracking will also have a big impact is social VR. So the moment the moment that I'm fixing my eyes on you, it's, it's, it's something that is ingrained in the in human psychology it's how we connect to other people as we look each other in the eye and this is something right now in, in, in social in social VR experience this is something that doesn't happen you don't really know exactly where a person is looking at because it's just the general direction of the head right mm -hmm. in a social VR experience if I'm, if I'm sharing a virtual space with other people and they suddenly they pass me by and they give me a little glimpse this is something that's very it's very subtle but it's a very, very strong cue for human communication. And then also you can you can extrapolate that to things like games, where imagine a game like Skyrim, you're, you're just walking through the streets of, um, of uh, what's, a, what's a city, Cloud? Damn it, I, so it's been such a long time that I've played it. I right. don't even remember the names of the towns. I forgot it too anyway, now. <laughs> what's a generic, named, a generic named town in Skyrim, and you're suddenly just walking through the streets, and, one of, and you're looking at an NPC, and the NPC looks back, you lock your eyes for just a split of a second, and then he starts talking to you. Right. These subtle little things where NPCs right. suddenly become more believable. This is something that's very, very strong, and we're gonna see the first glimpses of that. I'm, I'm very, very confident um, in 2019, where wow. many people get an, an idea of how eye tracking can actually make deeper, higher performance, more meaningful in your experience. Wow, incredible, really incredible. Looking forward to that, to see all of that happening. And then the last, as the last question, always I'm asking this question, when do you think will VR truly hit the masses? When is your mom going to buy a VR headset by her <laughs> own interest? Uh, that's a very good question. So my mom, okay, if I, if, if I manage to get my mom buying a headset on her own without me intervening. Exactly, right. Then I'm gonna- Exactly. Just, nothing would be on no, um, it's a very, it's a very good question. I, 
I think even things like the Quest, like Oculus Quest, and you probably get this answer a lot, um, will help drive this to the mainstream. Right. Because as much as I, I, I'm a true believer in high-end virtual reality, I believe that if you are showing something virtual, somebody virtual reality for the first time, don't do it in a Gear VR or in a Google Cardboard. Right. Take the extra, go the extra mile and use a high-end PC VR, crazy input, just high-end, like, like, like GPU-driven experience. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm fully aware that all those cables, all that setup, all those things, they, they, everyday Joe just doesn't want them. The everyday Joe wants a device that they put on their face, they take the controllers, and it just works. And this is something where, where I think a big part of the VR industry is, is betting a lot on the Oculus Quest because it has this promise of, hey, you could rest it on your kitchen table, right? And then if you wanna, if you wanna enjoy a, a show on Netflix in your personal theater, you just pick up the headset, uh, you pick up a controller, you set up the, you set up the, 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 um, the cinema, the virtual cinema, um, and then you, 20 minutes later, you just put it down on the, on the, on the coffee table again, or on the kitchen table again, and you're good to go. There's no hassle, it's hassle-free. So this is something that definitely, definitely has to happen for it to go really, really mainstream. Right, absolutely. The question, is, the, the question is, and I'm always saying this, where do you draw the line, right? What is, what is mainstream? Is it millions of headsets sold? Then we're already there. We're, there's already millions of headsets sold out there in the wild. Is it more than a thousand VR games on Steam? We're already there. There's more than 2,500 there. What is the metric for I when think, it hits mainstream? I if think it's really... The mom. mom. Yes, it's our moms. It's the mom metric. <laughs> that it has truly really reached it. Maybe I'll just maybe I'll just buy her. Maybe I'll just buy her a headset next year for Christmas and then see see if she ever uses it. Right. How does she have to buy it herself? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you that uh, Quest is probably going to have a really big impact and uh, yeah. So it's going to be super super exciting. Dominic yes. Very it, it has been an amazing time here to talk with you and I really know that we got like hours <laughs> in front oh, of yeah. us we could talk we could keep on doing this forever but uh, to keep the time frame like around 90 minutes we are already over <laughs> it we have to yeah. stop this right now but I'm so sure that you're going to be back in this show for sure people in XR and I'm going I'm so much looking forward to that but for now uh, I think it was an amazing show thank you so much for being on the show and I wish you all the best for your next career step in this exciting industry. This was amazing, Sebastian, really. I really enjoyed this. I've been on a couple of uh, podcasts about VR before, but uh, this was this, this, is, this is high up there in my, in my memories. And we didn't even get to talk about the educational. Oh, you're right. Oh my goodness. And the other project that I'm working on. All I'm right. Just gonna, I'm just gonna tease this yes, for please. viewers and say thanks a lot. For having me, uh, thanks again to Hologate for uh, for sponsoring their offices. Uh, just a little bit of a plug here, and yeah, would love to see you again at, at some event in the future. And uh, thanks yeah. for having. Very welcome. And you know what? Um, I really want to talk with you about this whole um, education part. And you know what? I think I'm just going to invite you into one of my live shows in the future. Oh, I would love that. Yeah, that would be I amazing. Would be my, would be my absolute pleasure. That would be you amazing. Become, Keep up the good work, man. It's always Thank nice you. to have voices like you um, talking about VR and XR and MR. It's really great. Amazing. Dominic, thank you so much for being on this show. My pleasure, man. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. And that's it for this episode of the People in XR podcast. I really hope that you enjoyed it as much as I and Dominic did. If yes, why don't you share this episode with your friends? Why don't you tell them about the People in XR podcast? I'm very much looking forward to meet you in the next episode. Until then, 